Bienvenidos a otro episodio de Empodérate de Chicanos por la Causa. We're really happy in April where the spring here in Arizona really feels like it's the perfect weather. The I spring miss. is springing. We're wearing all the bright colors, <laughs> the flowers. We, we're all out. And um, we're here to um, present our guest. Yes. And our guest for today is Yasmin Rivera Klein, recently married. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. And she is the president of the Association of Latino Professionals in, for America. Yay. So welcome, welcome. Yasmin. Welcome. ¿Cómo estás? Team, I'm so excited to be here and share this space and connect with the Latinas listening to us. Thank you. Yes. And also thank you for making arrangements to be here and share the space with us and, and our listeners. It's, it's really, um, really special that um, you want to make sure that you create, that you share the space with us. Um, and then um, we can start a conversation and, and talking about what it's like to be, you know, a young professional in corporate America today. But before we start that, how about we uh, begin with, um, you know, where, where did you grow up? Who? Oh, Um, I, I heard that you're from the East Coast. I am, I am. So I'm originally from Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is an inner city. And I think a lot of Latinos can relate to this. Um, I grew up with very little money, but uh, very rich in familia. So had a lot of love, especially from my grandparents who helped raise us. Um, my father passed away when I was about 10 months. So my mother raised us as a single mom. And, you know, there was just a lot of community. And so I take that with me and I share that. I'm moving across the country, I've, you know, craved that family again, but mm -hmm. been able to, to build community that. And that family comes from, tú eres boricua, ¿verdad? Yes, sí, sí. So my family is from, for any boricuas listening to us. Oh, um, yeah, we have them. Yes, my family. <laughs> Which I recently learned what a, um, where boricua comes from. Yes. And you said, can you share that again? Yeah. I think that was so interesting. I didn't know about that. Yes, absolutely. So Puerto Rico, the island, um, originally we were borinquen. And then when we were colonized, they renamed our island to Port of the Riches, a.k.a. Puerto Rico. And so that's because we had sugar cane and other spices that they were exporting. Um, and so that's why we are called Boricuas, if people didn't know that fun fact. Mm -hmm. A little history lesson. Right? History right. lesson. <laughs> yes. So how that uh, background and culture has influenced you um, throughout your life, especially at the very beginning when sometimes we you know, especially living in the United States and the East Coast, perhaps, and having that um, maybe um, a, a point in your life where you question about your identity or when do you bring your Latinidad to what you do? Yeah, thank you for asking because this is a really interesting point. So for me, um, I'm a proud No Sabo baby to anybody, yes. you know. <laughs> um, so when my grandparents on my mother's side, they moved here from Puerto Rico, the, both of them did not speak English. And so what they did was with their five children is they refused to speak Spanish at home. And the only time my, my mother and her siblings learned Spanish was at church. And mm -hmm. so they went four or five times. So they're very fluent. Um, but my grandparents, you know, really depended on that English and for their children to teach them. And so my mother carried that with her. And so she didn't speak Spanish growing up in the house. Um, so I understood. I understand Spanish. I still watch novelas. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but speaking it, I really, really struggle. And so that part of me never bothered me until I got of age and I went to college and I really wanted to connect more with my Latinidad and speak Spanish. My family would make fun of me, you know, for the Spanish that I spoke. And I said, well, you didn't teach me. So... You know, I don't think that this is fair. And so I really struggled like, okay, am I Latina because I don't speak Spanish and I don't mm -hmm. speak the language? Um, and the answer is yes, right? We're still like, Absolutely. you know, we still deserve to be in that space and share our culture and learn about it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely helped shape me and shape the way that I look at things. And I've asked the question of, do I deserve to be in these spaces for Latinos? Do I Do I deserve that? And the answer is, yeah, you definitely should be in connecting with them. Absolutely. And, and I think there is um, a new uh, generation shift on mm -hmm. that. I think there was a lot of um, burden that was put upon the next generations and that especially are raised in the United States, right? Uh, whether you speak one language or two that in, and, and not all of us, I think question at one point, are we enough, right? Are we mm -hmm. enough of this or where do we belong? Mm -hmm. And and the answer is everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> no yes. matter whether um, you speak two languages fluently or more than one, um, 
but the I, I think what certainly um, resonates is the pride that you have and that you carry that along with you and that you you open the paths for others that come behind um, mm-hmm. you to make sure that um, they understand that it's a safe space and everybody can join in. It's the, um, so we're talking about your path, um, your career path. Um, ¿Qué fue lo que estudiaste? I studied finance at Arizona State University. Uh, originally, I wanted to be a politician and like come and change the world. And then I came to Arizona. I moved here um, to go to ASU and I did the math and I was like, ooh, law school. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that math, you know, checks the math, out. Nothing. The math. <laughs> and I was actually really, really good at math. I'm very, um, I loved, I'm one of those weirdos that love calculus and statistics. And so I thought, you know, if I could do the math on law school and what the ROI is, you know, I probably should go into something with numbers. And so I was like, okay, let me do finance. I really love numbers. And um, I'd want to learn about investing and learn about growing money. And so that that's kind of where, where it went. That's mm-hmm. awesome. I love that because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think we have enough um, Latinos, especially Latinas um, in, in finance. I, I don't think mm-hmm. that we see enough leaders mm-hmm. um, that could share their stories so then others can see themselves in there. And um, because th- th- I think there is certainly a stereotype of who, uh, what that individual looks like in right. finance. Right. Did you come across, have you come across that? Yeah, so I graduated in May 2020 and then uh, worked in a finance and accounting like rotation program. I also had a couple of finance internships um, and... I loved it. I loved being in the numbers, but like I felt for me, there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And there was that like, ah, I want to connect more with people. I want to give back. I love helping people get jobs. And so I career pivoted into what I am in now. And so that's in DE&I and talent acquisition. Um, But what I've been learning along the way is that there are Latinos in finance Mm. A lot of them tend to put our heads down and they don't talk about the work and they don't show themselves all. They think their work speaks for themselves, but it doesn't. Um, so there's not many at the top. There's only less than right. 3% of executives. What do you say to those people? Wow. That, you know, like how you're saying that they think they're doing what they, you know, they should be doing, but they should really be um, like speaking up mm-hmm. or how you say it? How yeah, say it? yeah. People need to learn to, they have to advocate for yourself if you want to move forward in your career. That's just the truth, right? People, unfortunately, that's just not reality. You're not likely going to get handed a promotion in corporate America. It's normally the people who people are friends with. It's normally the mm. people who the leaders like. Um, and that's why we've been excluded from these spaces for so long because there's so few of us. And what is your advice for people to get themselves out there so then they don't fall into that? Yeah. For me, I would say get used to being uncomfortable and get used to being the only one, but also advocating for those people. And so if you are in corporate America, I want to encourage people to join their employee resource groups, get connected or a DEI council. Um, If you don't have that at your company, that's okay. You should join groups. Um, I will talk about some here, but join your local networking groups. So here in Phoenix, we have Alpha, you know, shameless plug. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But there's also a lot of great groups. There's, um, you know, the Young Professionals Group of Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Mujeres of all shades. Yeah, Mujeres of all shades. Yes, go watch that episode, guys. Um, And... Yeah, there's a lot of community you can tap into. And once mm-hmm. you network and once you have those mentors you can lean on of, hey, I'm going for this role. Do you know somebody? Or, hey, I need to negotiate for my salary. You know, can you get on the phone and help me? Tell me what I should say. Let's practice. Let's practice interviewing. That's what these communities and spaces are created for. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking earlier about the difference um, with young professionals now getting into corporate America Um, that we've seen that there's certain generations that don't even have not had the experience to even interview in person. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have a lot of people working remotely. And in in your case, right, your your headquarters for for the company that you work for is in in the East Coast as well. And you're based here. And then you're sharing the experience of how connected you are. How um, how can people that are entering into the workforce and in corporate America can develop those relationships? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So 
Um, just being honest, right? Like there is so much power in being remote. And here's why, because there's so many people that you can connect with and there's no difference, right? And you're kind of making it equitable for yourself. Um, so for me, I work in Arizona. My company's based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, but there are other remote people in California, New York, and Florida. And so I get to connect with them and they're like, wow, we're the same. You're not in office, right? Like we get to share that experience. Um, but if you are facing that, if you are stepping into a situation where you're remote and I don't know where to go, I don't know how to talk to people, I don't know how to you know, connect with people other than my boss, um, you need to reach out and ask people for virtual coffee chats. And so as silly as that sounds, for my Latinos, I always put on their calendar virtual cafecitos. Mm, there you um, go. But come prepared, find those connections. So if you have an employee resource group, that's normally an easy in or a DEI council. But if not, right, a lot of people volunteer with other groups. If you can learn or if you've heard them speak or if you've heard some connection or there's a project that they're leading or something you want to learn about in their specific group, don't be shy. People are willing to connect with you and teach you and help you grow. If you want to do a job shadow, if you want to learn about their career journey, um, just send an email, ask them, hey, you know, would you mind setting up 20 minutes? And throughout that connection, be prepared to have questions ready. Be prepared mm -hmm. to make those connections throughout your conversation of, yeah, I've heard you've done this and this. This is where I want to get into that. This is how I connect with that. This is what I want to learn from that. Um, you know, be prepared and, and keep those relationships going. Don't just have one, you know, make sure you're connecting with them on LinkedIn. Make sure you're sending follow-up notes. Make sure if there's a project coming up, right, you're either asking their advice or leaning on them. Um, and that's how you create mentors and sponsors. Then those are the people that will talk about you when you're not in the room. Absolutely. Yes, you're right. So mm -hmm. what are your recommendations once you have the attention of your boss or the department head that you wanted to move into and you happen to either be at a company um, event or an event that you were invited by the company, what do you do for those few seconds that you may have his or her attention? Yeah, so I'll, I'll share a story about back when I was an intern um, at Nationwide, I was a finance intern, and I went up to the chief talent acquisition officer at the time, no idea who he was. He had wings on his plate. And I said, hey, where did you get those? And that is how nice. our conversation started. And, you know, I was, and I just asked him, I said, you know, what, he was like, oh, there's some wings over there. And I said, oh, awesome. Um, what group do you work in and nationwide? And he mentioned talent acquisition and I shared, wow, I love, you know, the connectivity you guys bring to the candidates that you bring in and the experience you've created. Can you tell me more about like how your role impacts that? And so we created this connection and then three years later, I'm back in the talent acquisition group. And it's all because of that one conversation and sharing that space of, hey, I have interest in your role in your group. Can you tell me more about it? Um, and it just don't be shy. Don't be shy to bump elbows. Don't be shy to ask questions and be authentic. I'll tell you, I'm very clumsy um, and very natural. Sometimes I stumble on my words when I'm talking to executives and they likely don't care. You know, they, they just want to have an authentic conversation. Mm. They don't want people who have their answers prepared and they've typed it up and they've read it over and over and then they go up to them. Um, they want people who genuinely want to learn and want to connect. You're right. I'm interested in, because I feel like that's very nerve wracking to do, like mm -hmm. to make connections, especially like first starting off. Yeah. Um, what are other like, um, or what is your mentality? Like, what do you tell yourself when you, you know, you're pushing yourself. I know now you're very comfortable with being uncomfortable, but like starting off, like, what did you tell yourself to not be uncomfortable? I think it was... Or to push yourself to be uncomfortable. Yeah, I'll say, so growing up, um, I was one of those people, and this is a weird analogy, but I was one of those people <laughs> that wore pajama pants, like Cookie Monster, mm -hmm. like fluffy pajama pants oh, to the high grocery school? store. Yeah, in high oh. school. <laughs> In high school. That's um, such a niche thing. That's like, such a niche thing. Yeah. So if you that. know, you know. Yeah. But right. um, I think, so from an early age, right? Like sometimes it's just... So you know that's still in, by the way. Yeah, it was... No, yeah. I started that. <laughs> yeah, I just think... Kidding. You, you, you just kidding. Just kidding. I have a little statement. sister and I know it's still in because she wears those <laughs> right? pajamas, especially yeah, the, the pattern ones, the yes. red and black ones. Yeah. Where it's like squares. Yeah. 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 So I think just from an early age, you know, I was just 
sometimes very clumsy. I didn't really do sports. So at gym, I'd embarrass myself often. And so I just put myself back in that place of like, you know, you're never going to see these people again. Or if you do, you know, so what? Like you will go home and you will go to sleep. Or like in my case with those people from like high school or middle school or wherever I was, um, a lot of that experience was, you know, hey, I'll just move across the country. You know, what do you have to lose? <laughs> what's the worst that yeah, can happen? What's the worst that can happen? You know, I put myself in these situations and just remind yourself that we are all human. Mm-hmm. Everyone has embarrassed themselves. Um, yes. And if somebody who, and I always tell my friends this, and if, when they're interviewing for a company, if people don't want to accept you as who you authentically are, it's not the space for you. Right. That's not a place where you can thrive. Yes. What other like, um, uh, and what other like scenarios or how did like what, when you were first starting out, um, I'm trying to like say like, and what other ways did you feel like you pushed yourself out of your comfort zone and how do you feel like that benefited you? Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me was I volunteered for a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. Um, that I felt in my own head I was not qualified for. And so with that opportunity, I I raised my hand, I came up with ideas and I said, hey, I think we could really create this cool program. I think we should really be doing this event. I think we can create the community um, externally more. Like this is specifically at my company, but I also did that at Alpha, the place I was volunteering in. Um, And that helped me get more practice and helped me, you know, take those skills and take it into my corporate role. Um, but those experiences, right, led me to a place of, okay, I might fail, but, you know, I'm trying and people are willing to help me along the way. And so that'll allow me to um, create more connection, create more experiences. And this way I'll be better for the next time when it comes. Oh, so you mentioned Alpha. Is that how you initially got into Alpha with volunteering for them first? Yeah. Well, when I got into Alpha, I was a college student and um, we have collegiate chapters. We have one at Arizona State, University of Arizona. And then nationally, we also have a chapter in every um, city in the U.S. So Miami or national city, um, (laughs) large city, and then every major public university. So um, for Alpha, I was a first generation college student. I didn't know anybody. I was an out-of-state student. And there was reggaeton music playing. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Like, where's my people? <laughs> and this, no, this Latino, he comes out and he goes, are you Latina? And I said, what? I said, why? You know, what's, what a weird question. I said, why? <laughs> he goes, oh, no, 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 no. We have this club and, you know, we've got free food, you know. <laughs> and, I so like, and I was like, hot music. Okay. And music. No, you had me on reggaeton music. Yeah. That's where they had That's where yeah. Yeah. And I was That's like, okay, I heard the music. <laughs> I smelled the food. I was starving. It was six o'clock on a Tuesday. I was like, you know what? Why not? And so that group, um, we were all students. We were all figuring out on ourselves, on our own. And they helped me write a resume. They helped me network. They helped me get my first interview. Mm-hmm. Um, they helped me secure an internship and like having that community of other first generation Latinos who were figuring out in themselves helped me say, okay, they can do it. I can do it. We might not all know what we're doing, but we have each other and we're (laughs) going to do this together. That's certainly something that I felt from the very beginning when I had the opportunity to join um, some of the meetings and uh, attend some of the events. Uh, You guys are a true community, you guys have a really fantastic bond um, and supporting each other and having each other's back. It's, it, it's, it's really, truly amazing. And the stories behind you are, are, are really similar. You know, first generation college student. Um, it, it's really, really empowering to see how you guys have organized and created. You guys are one of the most active chapters right now in yes, the nation, right? Yes, we're top 10. Um, <laughs> first time in a couple of years, many, many, many years. But um, yeah, we are very, very fortunate. So for 2023, we're the most innovative chapter of the year. Mm-hmm. We grew a lot in 2023. We got a lot of more members. Um, Why do you think that is? Like, what do you think makes a successful like community like Alpha? Yeah. So when I took over as president last January, January, 2023, my goal was to really focus on the Alfamilia because when people are passionate and people feel connected and they understand the why, they're going to want to give back more and they want to create this for, for more people. And so we focused a lot of time on like bonding together as a team, building the team, and then I also, I just didn't want to do things the way we were doing them in the last couple of years. And so I I told the board, 
okay, we're going to do a retreat and we're going to create a space of creativity. What do we want to do? And so some of the ideas that came up were, you know, um, let's do a little bit of a twist on the bailando. Let's come up with, you know, more creative dances. Let's do dances and, you know, from native areas in Peru and El Salvador Mm. and like dances nobody knows. So we all look kind of silly and like it's fair. Um, and then for Women of Alpha, you know, we love our Women of Alpha program, but we were like, let's- another best. Yeah, let's let's have more fun with it. And so we were like, let's do a theme. Let's do a color. Let's make everyone kind of dress up. And so we did Latinas Can Be Anything and we made it a Barbie theme. And so we just opened up the doors of creativity. And I think that's what empowered people to say, I can create, I can become, I can be, I can do these things and help other people. And so I think that's why I, we are where we are today. I like how you set up a retreat because it um, allowed your team to like feel like a team and feel like they all had a voice and um, starting from scratch basically is what it sounds like Mm -hmm. and being innovative um, and pitching their ideas and feeling comfortable to pitch their ideas. So then it can come out to where it is, you know, the, the outcome that you guys had, which was really successful. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your pin. Oh, yeah. So yes. beautiful. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So this year, um, we have just announced the Woman of Alpha theme for 2024. It is Como La Flor. So get your purple ready. Um, also, this pin is for that program. So Como La Flor is playing in my mind. I know. I, know. I, do. I can't. I <laughs> promised my grandma I wouldn't sing it. <laughs> I promised her because she, I, I tried to do a test run on her. Um, our producer, please put some auto tune so we can sound a little better. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, she, she made me promise her, please don't sing that for other people. <laughs> I said, okay, grandma. Um, and so yeah, we'll be doing Como La Flor, get your purple outfits ready. It's going to be November 1st. All right. Um, and we are doing a brunch. We got asked, is it a brunch again? It is going to be a brunch. So it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of networking. Um, we're going to have, we're going to support local Latina businesses again. We're going to showcase Latina leaders from different sectors. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's we get to see It's going to be amazing. Yeah. So Aside from everything else that you mentioned so far, yeah. you also have a, a platform that you're launching, a nonprofit. Yes. Oh, Latina Love. An advocacy. Mm-hmm. Idea. Yes. I How just about that. Yeah, I just got my trademark for um Latina Out Loud. It just got approved. So I'm very, very excited about it. Um, I'm going through a branding shoot right now. We're going through a relaunch, but you can follow us. There are a lot of blogs. The, the platform really focuses on professional development and sharing experiences specific to Latinas. So an example of this is navigating guilt for making money and spending money, right? I can tell you for me, uh, one of the guilts that that have come up is um, recently I was like, I'm really busy. It would be nice to get some help cleaning the house. So I'm going to hire a cleaning person my grandmother cleaned houses Mm -hmm. and that guilt set in of you can clean that yourself. You don't need to, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not right. Right. Um, And you have to unlearn those things, unpack those things and other things that Latinas face too is, you know, we're often called aggressive or assertive Mm -hmm. if we exist in these spaces and we advocate for ourselves and that's not true. Or, you know, we, we overcome a lot of stereotypes of, you know, you only, if you are successful, a lot of people want to downplay that it's because of her looks or it's because of this, or it's because of that, um, not because of her real achievements. Right. And so, um, we need to recognize that and also just have a space for people to come and, and kind of learn and, I've never negotiated a salary before. How do yes. I do that? Right. And so that's really what Latina Out Loud is about. I love that. And that's that's certainly so key, especially the negotiation mm-hmm. and, and 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 asking for permission instead of just, hey, I'm, I'm gonna own this space and I know my worth. I, I know my value and then I'm gonna that's amazing. And I think that's perfect timing too, because this month is um, Financial Empowerment mm-hmm. Month. Yeah. So I guess, you know, to celebrate or um, to create awareness around, I guess like what are your tips in how to negotiate, you know, your salary or um, yeah. like what is your main advice? Okay. So first things first, you need to do research. So if you are on LinkedIn, you can actually look up the region where your role is. Um, and comparable roles. And so you could look up and say, hey, I'm looking for, let's use finance, senior financial analyst, Phoenix, Arizona. What is the median salary? You could do that. There are a couple of other sites as well. 
Um, but you want to do your research thoroughly and identify, okay, this is the region that I'm in. This is what the competitor roles are. These are what competitors are paying. Here's the median average in the United States. Um, you want to make sure, depending on the role, depending on your experience, let's say if you have more experience, if you have a master's, right, you want to negotiate up mm. and you want to identify that worth. Um, it also helps um, a secret tip to corporate America. I did not know personally is that a lot of companies have something called bands. And so um, the company that I am in, it is by letters. And so normally, um, depending on the company, they want to put you directly in the midpoint of that band. So that is a sweet mm. spot. And so you could either negotiate your title to be a different band if that's not the salary, but that'll help you better understand where you are from a comparable um, standpoint. And so if you are, um, let's say, going for a G band, right? And the experience level um, is normally like eight to 10 years for a G band. So the pay might range from 100K to 160. So ideally you'd want to be at 130, mm. for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or, but if you have more experience and say, hey, I am not at that midpoint, you know, I might be a little bit over that, then let's make a strategy and get you to 145. So it all comes down to research, research and telling your own story mm. and advocating for yourself. So don't be shy. You know, I think a lot of people are like, oh, they came up over you know, than what I expected. So I'm not going to say anything. No, 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 no. You still say something. <laughs> you know, you still say something. You still advocate for that. Um, so just being comfortable doing research, understanding your worth, but lean on people. And so um, if you don't know what that's worth or you don't know where to start, um, find a local um, networking group that focuses on professional development. So here in Phoenix, we have Alpha and other cities across the U.S., but there's others as well. So mm -hmm. just find a mentor, go to a safe space where you can ask those questions um, and ask people too. I think a conversation we have with the Alpha board at least is how much we make. Mm -hmm. And that's a really uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. Um, but it's helped us realize like, oh, you're making that? Like, mm -hmm. I should be making that, you know? And, and we've helped each other like, okay, well, I need a job, you know, switch companies or I want to get to that place or I want to get to the career field that you're in because you make X dollars, right? And so we've had those conversations in safe spaces. Um, and so having that community that you can lean on is always helpful as well. I think that's very empowering because yeah. you only know what you know. And mm -hmm. I think it also just um, emphasizes why, you know, we should push ourselves out of our comfort zones to make connections and have those type of conversations, which, you know, money can be a taboo topic. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's perfect timing for yeah. Financial Empowerment Month. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent tip. Um, in terms of DI, I'm um, 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 curious about what's, what's your take. Um, there was a resurgence of support, national mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. for a few years. Yeah. And then it's been, it's seen... It's dwindled. Been, yes. Yeah. What do you think companies should be doing more off that they're not doing? Yeah. I'll tell you for Alpha, we've definitely seen, and I completely understand it. A lot of companies have, you know, cut their budgets. And so the first thing to go is DE&I, right? Can you explain a little bit of DEI for, for yes. some? But yes. If you are not familiar, yeah. DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you may also hear DEIB, um, which is includes belonging, so um, a lot of companies are facing a lot of pressure, right? Just given the economy. And so the first mm. things that they're going to do is cut their budgets, cut their spending. And so DEI is facing the forefront of that. And so things like Alpha or other organizations that focus on DEI and advancing Latinos or other groups, um, they're not getting as much funding. They're not getting as much support. So I think for companies, I think they have to really think about the long-term yes. strategy, yes. right? Like if you could really spend a couple thousand dollars to maintain your partnership, think about the long-term partnership versus the damage you could potentially be doing by saying, hey, when times were tough, we washed our hands of everything and our employees, you know, they may be disengaged. They may have left us. You might be losing talent in the long-term. So You've, it might be penny wise, pound foolish, right? Like we need to think through, hey, what in the long term, what's going to make us money in 2025 when the market turns back, right? Or when that short term is. Or when the next census comes right? out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, 
Latinos is the emerging market we should be focusing on. Mm-hmm. And if we want more Latino clients, then we should have more Latino yes. staff and yes. leaders, right? Um, I remember having this conversation many years ago because DEI used to be called multicultural mm. department. And, and of course, it, it's, it's shifted a lot to right. a lot more, right? Mm. Um, but I, I remember that we started seeing a lot of cuts with companies that we um, partnered with um, in this area, even in staff, and obviously on the company's investments as well. And um, I remember very well one of our um, the first at CEO that I worked for at CPLC. We were at this um, at this um, meeting with this partner, and it was because the census had just come mm-hmm. out with a new, and they were like. Hey, let's have Chicanos and tell us, hey, what are you, what, what ideas do you have to reach out to the Latino market? And, and that was his question. Well, the question, my first question to you guys is, what is your long-term strategy? Because if you don't have one, you need to start from there. Right. Because right now you're seeing the immediate situation, but, you know, Latinos are so-and-so-and-so, you know, they're first. And then yes. you have, and they're loyal customers or loyal viewers or loyal consumers. And so if you want that, then you need to invest long-term. If not, it's just every quarter, then you shift and change. Mm-hmm. And, and then we are again the next year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is so true. Yeah. yeah. If people forget about Latinos, if these companies forget about Latinos and they forget about the market. And I mean, you could just look at the research, look at our GDP power, Mm -hmm. look at, you know, how many of us are becoming business owners, look at, you know, the generations coming up by 2030, right? We're expected to be 20% of the U.S. or over that um, threshold. And we need to start reflecting the communities that we serve in corporate America. And so, we need to think about, you know, how are we connecting with those products? How are we connecting with these markets? What are those long-term strategies and companies that aren't doing that, that aren't connecting with the CPLCs, with the alphas, right? They're just going to be behind in the long term. They're not going to be able to connect with us and they probably won't survive, you know, years to come if they're not connecting with us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think you do so much and it's really interesting how you balance everything and, you know, especially really inspiring, like how young you are too. Um, I guess like my, que- my last question to you would be like, what is like, what drives you? Like, what is your purpose mm-hmm. to do everything that you do? Mm, I think, um, for me, it was always really difficult being the first. Mm. So I, I never want someone to face that, you know, I want it to make it easier for the Latinos, the Latinos, um, to come, you know, behind me and say, oh, this is a little bit easier, right? And we want to make it easier for those people. Um, Other things that drive me, I'm a dog mom. I'm a proud dog mom. And (laughs) uh, I want my dog to see the world. I really do. But, um, you know, just being able to connect with the community and and give back to the way that it's served. Because if there weren't organizations, there weren't mentors, there weren't people to, that I can lean on, I would not be where I am today. I would not be, um, I would probably wouldn't have even been able to make it to college, you know, and so um, giving back, right, I think is what motivates me and empowers me. Well, thank you for all that you do and for opening the doors, um, being such a trailblazer. But I, I I would think that that's exhausting at one point. So tell us what you do for fun. ¿Qué le das a zona tu vida? I love, love, love being creative. Mm. So I get to do that with Alpha, funny enough. Um, but like, we're planning a tech summit watch party right now. And so we were just... Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we were just talking about what color conchas do we want? You know, like, <laughs> what's the balloon? Yasmin, you got to help us design the space. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> They're like, yes, yes, this is my, like, this is what I like to do for fun. So I love designing when I can, getting creative. Um, other things I like to do is I'm really into Pilates. So I like to go to the gym, make sure my life is balanced. I think... If I get, life gets so crazy that I feel like I can't go to the gym, I say, you know what? Like, it's not that important. Things are going to have to slip. Like, I have to put myself first. That's mm-hmm. something I like to do to make myself feel um, like I'm taking myself seriously and, and, and prioritizing self-care. Um, and yeah, my husband and I, we really like to travel. So whenever we can, travel a lot for work. But so between work trips, like, can I extend one? Can I, right. can I do things for fun? So traveling is big as well. What has been the most um, that you recommend to go or that you would go back? 
Ooh, I would say St. Martin and the really? Caribbean. Yeah. yeah, they had such beautiful, beautiful beaches. beaches. Yeah. yeah. Puerto Rico, of course, will always have a of special course. place. La Isla del Encanto, por algo se llama así. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, we're going to Europe next year, though. So I've never been to Europe. So that'll be like the test because I've always wanted to go. Um, so we're going to go for three weeks, which is... Oh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. What part? Um, we are doing Rome, Greece, um, and... Somewhere else, I can't remember, but probably we might just kind of take all the towns Those in. Those two are such great choices. Yes. Lots to do, great food, and great drinks. So yeah. you will have tons of fun for sure. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, for changing your plans to be able to come here. We appreciate that so much. Um, I admire so much more. And appreciate everything that that you do. Thank you for coming today. Thank you both. Thank you both so much for having me. One and two again, creating this space and getting to see. Like I'm a viewer. I'm a listener every every week. Every time you guys drop an episode, <laughs> I love it. I get to learn from other Latinas. And so having this community, and especially having it so local in Arizona, right? Getting to see Latina leaders that I know, I hear the story I didn't know the side of, or or learn more, like. Um, Mujeres of all shades. I didn't know that existed until you guys posted that. And so now I'm a follower and I'm going to go to one of their events. But yeah, thank you both. And it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Well, that's a wrap for another episode of Empoderate. Mm -hmm. Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> Maria. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Empoderate de Chicanos por la Causa. <laughs>